thanks, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for being here, and thanks, for, thanks for organizing this one. Because um, I have the dubious privilege of coming from the only country that's been named by name in the program and in the talks. So I, I, I will, I will try to clarify why that is. I'm afraid. Um, so <laughs> I want to talk about uh, the, the the extent to which this um, bubble has long-term consequences for Spain. Um, some of what I'll say uh, was found originally in, of, in a book that we have uh, written together, a few Spanish economists who are working on a blog. For those of you who can read Spanish, the blog is called Nada is Gratis, uh, Nothing is Free, like no free lunch. And, um, and uh, I recommend you because it's, it's, we write there every day um, after the commercial break. Um, basically, the Duchess is, refers to a um, one sector kind of asymmetric growth process in which one sector booms, normally the natural resource sector. We see that in in uh, developing countries, and it's of course in that it kind of places some some serious burdens on the other sectors. Um, I want to make an analogy, a bit of a loose analogy, because it's not a trade, it's not a traded sector, it's not an export sector, uh, with with bricks and sand as our as our Dutch disease as our. You know, sector that is kind of placing major distortions in the economy. I think the basic story is well known and I'm going to kind of uh, go quickly through it and then I'm going to focus on those long-term consequences. Um, Spain converged, uh, just from a, from a study we did McKinsey recently, uh, Spain converged very rapidly and very successfully over, over the period of pre and post, immediately post-Euro entry. Um, to 11 percent of the of the GDP per capita of the European Union. Um, however, there was very high uh, inflation divergence, very di very different inflation performance. This has to a large extent to do with the, with the institutions in the labour market in Spain, the collective bargaining arrangements, which are very inflexible and very inefficient. Essentially, um, all the empirical work shows that uh, wages in the different sectors respond to past inflation. They don't respond to future inflation expectations. They don't respond to productivity or to any other thing. Essentially, workers just look at the wages in the previous period and employers and just at uh, the inflation, and they just basically reproduce the, the past inflation and the future wage settlements. So there was this persistent inflation divergence that people were aware of before the euro and expected the institutions to change and to modernize after the euro. It didn't happen. And the consequence, of course, is that uh, the real interest rate that people were facing here is the Euribor minus the, um, the just the consumer price in, in, in index. The, the basic uh, interest rates that people face when they're getting mortgages, etc., big term negative. The, the monetary policy, the one size fits all monetary policy, was was really very expensive for Spain. Now, of course, the, I mean this is fantastic. Okay, nobody can complain. Okay, negative interest rates, uh, we can borrow. This somebody is giving us a transfer. We are we are delighted, right? Um, and yes, that's, 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 that's nice, uh, depending on what you do with the money, I guess. Um, so where does the cheap financing go? And as you know, the answer is it goes to the real estate sector to a large extent. And why? And I mean, it's always hard to tell why a bubble would start or why, why a sector. I can tell you that Spain is unusual in the proportion of owners who buy accommodation. More than 80% of housing of, of, of families live in their own housing. This is the highest uh, proportion of any European country, and, and, and of course, in the US. Um, people have been used to inflation, to crisis, to defaults, and have grown habituated to bricks and mortar being the only safe asset, so that's where they put their money. Uh, that's what happens on the demand side. People can borrow cheaply, they just go out and get bigger mortgages. On the supply side, what you had was an economy which three times over the last 30 years has reached 20% uh, unemployment in 86, in 96. Uh, and now, uh, so at the time when all this gets going, you have a large pool of unemployed people that have uh, low skills. What is the obvious sector? You think in terms of what is the complementary investment to that type of pool of workers? Well, housing is a pretty natural one. And you had these labor institutions, which were a dominance of temporary contracts that made it easy to kind of invest in that sector. Plus, you had something that Tano uh, in, the, in the second half of this talk is going to talk about the banking and the financial system. I'm, going to, I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, when you have very brutal competition from the previously savings and loans, uh, very regulated in the past, the Cajas, um, 
that suddenly because of the European Union they are allowed to move out to other, other provinces. And the way they move out to other provinces is basically they only make loans which are backed by real assets. They make mortgage loans and commercial real estate loans. And they make extremely low margins. This is like 70 institutions competing very aggressively. Uh, margins right now, even today actually, shockingly enough, but for sure during the crisis you could get Euribor plus 0 0.25 was a standard. Everybody you talk to, you ask any Spanish friend of yours, they get Euribor for the 0 0.25 loans. So extremely thin margins. That means, hey, let's go out, let's get, let's get going borrowing in the real estate segment. Um, this is the, the, the commercial real estate, the developer loans, and the mortgage credit as a proportion of all credit. As you can see, the top number is the G proportion of GDP. So it went from 8% of G GDP was in uh, commercial real estate trade to 42% of G GDP in a, in a very short time period. Um, those uh, construction and developer loans, 420 billion, are the problem of Spain right now. I'll, I'll show you later, and then I will show you how much, how much they are contaminating the balance sheets of the bank. Uh, in terms of the households, maybe the, the pattern is here not as large. 69% um, of all credit to households, uh, to 80% of all credit to households became mortgages. But as a proportion of GDP, again, it went from 17 to 62%. So 100% of GDP, essentially, between <coughs> commercial real estate and mortgage and credit. Um, and a big external financing gap, as you are basically borrowing uh, to fuel this expansion. Uh, on the right, you have the actual, the actual financing needs year by year. On the left, you have the deficit. You see that imports, both imports and exports, are growing very much. I don't want to overstate my case in terms of how much uh, the economy was losing competitiveness. The, uh, sorry, let me just, just make this quick point. The export quota of Spanish companies was holding up. So the US lost 30 points of export quota. The UK also. Spain is the light blue line. So the export companies, the Spanish companies were exporting still through all this boom, but imports were really exploding and you had a huge accumulation of private debt. Okay, this is the basic story. By the end of it, this is a, uh, McKinsey is doing this uh, every year. Um, by the end of it, Spain had uh, private debt uh, equivalent to 300% uh, debt to the, of, the, of the GDP compared to like US uh, 200. It's worse than, uh, we, are, we are better off than the UK, but we're worse than basically everywhere else in terms of private, private debt, not in terms of the aggregate. Okay, so that's the basic story. The focus of what I want to say is on what are the consequences of this. Okay, so what we have is um, a large um, amount of resources that suddenly become available to these extremely low, too low interest rates, and they are directed to a large extent, not only, okay, of course, all these export companies are growing, all these Spanish corporations are becoming multinationals and buy abroad, but to a large extent, a lot of it gets, gets taken to real estate. Some of I have to say, won't, won't surprise you, but some of what I'm going to say will surprise you quite a bit, and I want to start with that. Obviously, housing is not a high skill sector. Okay? Anybody can put bricks and anybody can lay mortar on those bricks. Um, the kind of growth that we had is a growth that actually lower incentives for human capital investments and I had very low DFP growth. This graph was very well known by Spanish economists and was a source of infinite worry during the last 20 years. Something that Tano will mention as well is that the bubble in Spain wasn't as big a surprise as somewhere else. I mean, people have been worried about these things for the last 10 years. Um, so this is the, the composition of GDP growth in Spain, um, higher than in the US, much higher than the European Union, but look at what kind of growth we have. It's labor, a lot of unemployed people who get to work, a huge increase in female labor force participation, and an enormous amount of immigration. Spain started the, the period with 0% immigration and finished with 10% immigrants. The 10% of the population is foreign born. So that happened in a few years. And no TFP growth, okay? Minus 0.7%. You might think it's all sectoral composition, but that's not the case, okay? Of, of that negative TFP, um, half of it is within sector and another half is between sectors. So yes, some of it is what is growing is just bricks and mortars and that's a low productivity sector and serving coffees and, and meals in, in hotels and the beach is also low TFP, but, but there is also kind of low TFP growth overall as kind of you're getting, it's a, I mean, it's even within sectors probably compositional to some extent as you're incorporating into a labor force a lot of 
marginal, previously marginal workers. So low productivity growth, a very intensive type of, of growth, a very extensive type of growth, sorry. What is most unusual is the dis distortion in the human capital investment decisions. Okay, so if a lot of what I told you, you could think is happening in many places in the US. Um, there was an enormous amount of mortgage debt. I think right now it's around 14 trillion. Um, there was a lot of commercial real estate um, loans all over. I think probably the difference is how much that sector mattered for the entire economy. And what in Spain, one of the bad things that happened is that the, the bubble investments required very, very low levels of human capital investment. Uh, as I was saying, anybody can do this. And what that implies is that the wage signals that were received were drop out of college. Now it's very fashionable to be against inequality, and we forget that inequality is doing, as economists we know, inequality is doing a very useful job and sending a signal that certain investments should be undertaken. And here's what happens when you don't have increasing inequality but dropping inequality. Uh, those, uh, look at males, which is the figure on the left, uh, and uh, you can see that the, the ratio in blue is a college relative to high school uh, wage premium. Anybody who knows any labor economics, follow labor economics for the last 15 years, knows that that's been skyrocketing everywhere. Uh, in Spain, it was dropping, okay? The college premium were dropping. Um, and the other one is high skill occupation versus low skill occupation, dropping as well. This is something we, we put in as gratis. Now there's, there is a paper that came out just a month ago um, computing this, this from social security data carefully. The one I put in red is um, the 90-50 the ratio, the 90-10 ratio, the 50-10 ratios. I mean, it's pretty shocking to see four, minus 4%, four minus 2%, minus 1% for males, minus 10% in the, in the, in the male, uh, in the 90-10 in the ratio, okay? In perspective of what we are hearing in the US, Everybody should be dancing and being very happy about this egalitarian Spanish economy. Uh, of course, you can imagine what comes next. What comes next, well, let me actually show you the comparison with the US and Germany. It's not a European phenomenon. Here I have German data, and the German data shows you the 8515 um, from this paper. Sorry, you can't see the name, so I, let me say the name. Bonomen Hospital, uh, uh, March 2012. Um, so Germany had increases in the, look at the men, since those are the ones doing these, 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 with, with these jobs actually show up, the construction jobs. 83, 80.3, 10.7 increases in Germany uh, before the period and after the period. Spain had increased in those ratios, but during the period that we're talking about, 10% drop in the ratio. And as I was saying, uh, it, it's, it's, not, um, it's not hard to imagine that construction does play a crucial role in this. Uh, look at, look at the, the construction uh, figures are uh, this darkest line, so construction is this one, okay? You see that the share of construction workers in the economy went up from 14% to around 21% over the period. But look at the, at the salaries in construction. So construction was the 30th percentile of the wage distribution when it started. It finished in the 14th percentile of the wage distribution. So big increase in demand in that sector and big increase in the shares, quantities and prices. Uh, what does that signal tell people? Um, you have a lot of rotation, temporary contracts, the institutions are going to help to make kind of this an economy where uh, people can kind of spend a few months working in construction, get some money, kind of drop out, do something else, get some unemployment. Um, so, so big uh, proportion of temporary work, uh, as you see it, for all workers in red and for even from uh, workers with university, with college degrees, big increase in temporary work. So, I mean, all of it is giving you an environment, this kind of egalitarian environment, I'm, asking, I'm, 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 I'm positing, where dropping out of school is a good idea in order to put some bricks and, and, and get a construction job. This is, this is probably the worst news about Spain I could give you, and I'm almost reluctant to, to give it. Um, this is the dropout, the proportion of people between 18 and 24 was a years old who uh, didn't finish, who has secondary, only the obligatory secondary school education. It's 30% uh, only Turkey and Malta are worse. Uh, Portugal, Iceland, Italy, um, nowhere Romania kind of immediately, much, much lower the European Union has half. Look at the trend. And this tells you that when I was telling you about relative prices, I mean, this suggests, I'm not proving anything, that when I was telling you about relative prices, 
uh, giving signals to workers on what to do with their lives is actually probably correct. Um, the red line is the proportion of dropouts um, of people who drop out of, of, of school without the obligatory education. And what you see in it is that it was having, I mean, you know, you have still bias technological progress. People want to do school, people have wanted to go, go to college, they want to finish high school and go on and study more. And that's what you see until 97, okay? And that's what you see in every country in this sample. Portugal, uh, it's dropping. Blue line is Italy, it's dropping the dropout rate. And that happens to Spain. And then, 98, 99, it flattens out. And it continues dropping in the other countries. So, whereas the, at the start of the decade, just to compare with Portugal, Spain had a 10 point advantage versus Portugal in dropout rates. By the end of the decade, Spain had been passed by Portugal. And it looks from this graph that Malta, uh, and I wouldn't be shocked if even Turkey would, would not, I mean, at this rate, uh, get there. So, the signals that people are receiving are, this is a sector that is growing and that has lots of jobs where you can earn a good living and where you don't have to study, just get out and do it, okay? Low TFP growth and uh, low investment in human capital. First, consequence of the bubble that is gonna be hard to reverse. As you very well know, 50% of the young people in Spain are unemployed. Um, of the 2.8 million jobs that were destroyed over the last four years, 80% have been from people who didn't have anything more than high school. 80% okay. so of the jobs destroyed correspond to these kind of people. Who, I mean, you could say optimally or suboptimally. I mean, they had some expectation based on the prices they were seeing in the market that they could just drop out and earn some good living uh, without studying further. And that's hard to revert. Okay. That's hard to revert. Second thing that's hard to revert is the, is the collapse in revenue and the increase in deficit um, from the government. Uh, as people have said, and as you are all probably well aware of, Spain had a balanced budget. Uh, since the start of the Euro period, as you see, the orange, the reddish uh, line, my, my wife says I'm colorblind, let me say it's red and hope that I'm right. Um, the red line, it's basically of the black line and, and, and basically it's even better than the black line. You, you have big surpluses. This is related to this idea that we were saying that in Spain people knew there was a bubble. I mean, it wasn't like, oh, what a big surprise. The finance minister, if you talk to him, he'll tell you at the time, he'll tell you he was just trying to push the public debt as low as possible because he knew things were going to be bad. And the central bank governor, yes, banks were not very regulated, but the truth of the matter is Spain had introduced a generic provision requirement that the banks had to accumulate reserves because it was kind of known that things were going to get bad. But how bad? Well, you can see 2008, what happens let me just give you just a rough, rough sense of what's going on. Unemployment subsidy right now is 4% of GDP. It's 40 billion. 4% okay? of GDP. Look at that black line. Okay? From 40 to 46 is the deterioration. Four of those six points are basically unemployment subsidy. I mean, it's really a very large amount of deterioration. Three points on the revenue drop, three points are value added tax, and three points are income taxes. Okay? So essentially, all the deterioration is the floor falls out of the revenue and you have all these people who are unemployed and that's going to be hard to reverse. And why is it going to be hard to reverse? Because this revenue had been basically built into the system and because the political economy of Spain has two nasty things that, make, um, that can make us worried about, about, about the future. The first nasty thing for the political economy of Spain is that the, the um, age, the pyramid, the population pyramid is of course not a pyramid. Uh, that's not unusual for, 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 for a Western country. Spain is a little bit late on this. Uh, the baby boom was a bit later, but it's going to be pretty bad. Touching the pensions is very hard. The government, just after they got in, announced a new government, a 1% increase in weapon pensions. Okay? That's not what you would expect in a situation like the one Spain had, but it's going to be hard to cut that kind of, or that kind of revenue, both health and pension. We are just starting to discuss, it's been started to discuss last week, a, a co-payment system for medicines for pensioners. Until now, pensioners could get all medicines for free. There's going to be a new co-payment system. Uh, that's the dependency ratio to just give you a sense of yeah, the magnitude yeah. of the change. Yeah. Ratio of 65 plus to, um, to, to, to grow. The second tricky thing from the political economy perspective is that Spain has decentralized during the boom. Okay? This CEAA is how you say in Spain the regions, the autonomous communities. They handle 36% of expenditure. 
and the mechanisms, it's not so much how much they handle. You can have a decentralized system that works well or a centralized system that works well. You, you, I shouldn't need to tell that, obviously, to, to Americans. Um, the problem is that all of this happened while times were good, and the region just got used to kind of building a lot of fat and not putting any controls. So it's not so much that the expansion is decentralized, but that the region, the way that the expansion works is the regions get a, a, a projected budget from the state for next year, they spend it, and then they present the bills, then the bills get done, and then they discover that they spend much more, that, that they receive much less than was forecast because the revenue that the government anticipated didn't come. And that's already two or three years later. Uh, that gap between the money actually coming in and, and the money being budgeted and spent by the region. So it gets first spent and then liquidated by the state. So the incentives are very bad. The regional politicians have strong incentives to basically spend money and then hope that they can uh, get the money back. The government has done reforms here. Um, the unemployment issue that I discussed before has been dealt with uh, to some extent with some of the reforms. I, I would like to talk a little bit, but it's going to be tricky. In terms of the regional uh, budgets, there's been a new financial stability law that was passed last week that allows the government to intervene in a similar way to the European Union fiscal rules where you need approval for the budgets. The government is going to have that kind of approval, approval uh, possibility. <coughs> the last thing, oh, I wanted to compare the total debt. The public debt is still not that bad. I am showing here the total debt, as you, as you know, probably starting to be aware, the debt as to the excessive deficit procedure and the total liabilities are two different numbers. Um, there is quite a bit of off balance sheet debt, but you can compute it, and even with that off balance sheet debt, the numbers look worse, of course, but they don't look as bad for Spain as for all other countries. I think the shocking number here, when I saw this graph this morning, it's, it's just been put up by, by La Caixa, is France. France has 85% debt to GDP ratio, but 29% off balance sheet. I mean, it's the country where it, it's most shocking. Spain is still um, lower than other countries, but at the rhythm we're accumulating debt, that's not really uh, very encouraging. The last thing I wanted to say is the last long-term consequence is the land. I mean, the stunning thing of Spain, like Phoenix, Arizona, or like Las Vegas, Nevada, and all that, is you have a price bubble in a place with a horizontal supply curve. Okay? You have infinite Spain. If you drop flown to Spain, the only thing that Spain has is space. Okay? It's empty. Um, so you can just build, and it has fantastic public transport. So you can just go to the next village and the next village. Why would prices ever grow? Okay, like in Las Vegas, I mean, you can just, the marginal house, you can add it, there's no constraint. Um, so indeed, with all these big price increases, housing was built. This is my own calculation, and it's worse than the government and the Bank of Spain calculation. I'll explain you why. The first row is finished housing, the second is new housing sold. So there's basically a 200,000 extra amount of houses added every year um, to the stock. The stock is the, is the, is the number below. I calculate one and a half million. Why the difference with the Bank of Spain or the, or the finance ministry, which is, is less than a million? Basically, there is sales that are own promotions that you, you build your own house and you sell it to yourself so it doesn't account as a sale. And that's why this is an upper bound. Nobody really knows how many those sales are and I've tried to get it. I don't know. What we know is that there is a lot of empty houses. How many? I mean, on my calculation, I admit it is the pessimistic upper bound. When the US numbers were like 12 months, uh, the Spanish numbers are like 100. Okay. You could have a hundred months of sales. Uh, you can see it. I mean, uh, it depends on how you calculate it. But it, on those numbers, it would be 200 uh, sales per year to 1.5 million. I mean, it's a lot of years of housing that you have. And the commercial real estate loans that came with this housing are still to be digested, which is what Tano will talk about. Um, you give me a minute? One. Um, I, I have to give a talk later, so I might not read for the q and A. I, I'll give the trade talk at 4.15. I hope I will stay, depending on how much time I'll take. So I will just say something quickly, which is, um, the, um, the government is doing reforms. The unemployment market, the labor market is changing. Um, they are going to put some uh, serious uh, bite into the budget of the, of the autonomous communities, and they are trying to get the banks to fix themselves through uh, set, I mean, using their own uh, cash. Well, I could explain that, but Tano will explain that much better. But I don't think Spain is going to be able to solve this on its own. I mean, the banking system is going to need, some bad bank is going to need money from the outside. The amazing thing is, even if you take these numbers that I showed that were pessimistic, this problem is peanuts, okay? It's a big problem. It's 100 billion, maybe, that you will need to fund a bad bank, okay? Not losses, but 100 billion of capital. 
I mean, compared to the kind of problem we're talking about in a euro crisis where the euro is, is collapsing, compared to the loss of growth, okay, a 10 trillion economy that loses one, two points of, of growth every year because it's in kind of in this crisis and in this panic, I think it's worth it. It's a good investment to kind of take those houses out of the books and kind of swallow in little by little and allow the credit to flow back into Spain. The other thing that is complicated is the labor market. So many unemployed people, it's a problem. Uh, Jacques Delpla is proposing with, with uh, Guggen Schatz, is proposing something along the lines of the European Union uh, unemployment, a contract that would have zero termination costs would come with some money from, from the European Union. I don't know what would be the right way to do it, but I, I would think this is probably a good investment uh, compared to the cost of what we're seeing. And what we are seeing is the situation very rapidly deteriorated in Spain, a very complex uh, combination of competitiveness, uh, budget deficit, and uh, and uh, housing overhang, and, uh, <laughs> something that I don't think at this point doesn't look like Spain is going to be able to solve.